everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for the June Ag Sector Council seminar titled Creating Policies for Scaling Smallholder Access to Quality Seed. Uh, the Ag Sector Council seminar webinar series is a product of the USA Bureau for Food Security and is implemented by the Feed the Future Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project, also known as KDED. Uh, my name is Julie McCarty. I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the Bureau for Food Security and I'll just be your host slash facilitator today. Uh, so before we get started, I always like to remind people to please silence your cell phones if you're here in the room, just so that we don't interrupt the speakers. And I'll do that myself. I've forgotten in the past. <laughs> As a facilitator, I should be on top of such things. Um, I'd also like to let you know that this uh, event is being recorded. And if you came here today and signed in and all of that, uh, you'll get a uh, email after the fact letting you know when the recording is available. We also have a sizable webinar audience. Our webinar audience is generally maybe two to four times the size of our in-person audience uh, from all over the world. So that's always exciting. And um, so because we're recording and because of the webinar audience, when it comes time to the Q&A, which we generally hold till after the presentations, uh, we just ask that you wait for the microphone to be passed around so everyone can hear you, especially the webinar audience. All right, so without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers, and we'll get underway. Uh, we have three speakers today. Uh, the first uh, to kick us off and set the stage for what Feed the Future is doing on seed systems is Mark Heisinger, a senior program manager in the USA Bureau for Food Security working on Feed the Future programs. Oh, here, I, I shall uh, click on over to his bio, or if you wouldn't mind, just yeah. clicking one slide over. All right, and his, his beautiful picture as well. <laughs> uh, he manages the Scaling Technology Partnership, uh, conducts investment due diligence and modeling, and, and analyzes commercial, legal, and institutional reforms for ag development. He's also researched approaches to breeder and foundation seed production by U.S. states and was a key contributor to the early generation seed study, uh, which you'll learn more about today. Uh, next up will be Pradeep Prabala, uh, a senior manager with Monitor Deloitte. He leads their work in agriculture and food security in emerging markets and has worked extensively across Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, he has led Monitor Deloitte's work with USAID on Feed the Future private sector action plans and has supported governments across Africa and Asia on transforming ag sectors through inclusive private investments uh, and, and also worked extensively in fertilizer and seed systems. And so he'll be talking about early generation seed market archetypes in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then joining us from Kenya, you'll hear her voice a bit later, is Charlie Doom, uh, who will be discussing East Africa trade harmonization efforts for seed. And she's an Ag Foreign Service Officer uh, with USAID and manages the Integrated Partnership Assistance Agreement with the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, COMESA. Um, and she focuses on seed, biotech, and regional policy harmonization. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Mark to kick things off. Should I stand? Uh, I know probably people will see me a little better. Um, all right, so I see a lot of real seed experts in the room. So I don't know how much I'm going to be able to shed a light on anything that you guys don't already know, especially this guy. Uh, so. In uh, th there's five emerging areas in Feed the Future where we're seeing some real constraints in the seed sector. One of them is the agriculture business enabling environment framework. Uh, this isn't new. We've had uh, challenges with these in many countries for a long time, but uh, it has been uh, problematic in some countries, much more so than in others. Uh, early generation seed supply scarcity, um, generally low capacity of some of the NARS and uh, the, the seed companies. Financing continues to be a challenge and uh, just generally farmers awareness of improved varieties of seed. So if we just look at the agribusiness enabling environment uh, for seeds, so there's, there's two basic models. One is the US, the other is the EU. And uh, what we see is that uh, for registration of seed companies and uh, contract farmers in the U.S., there's no requirements that such companies register. Although individual states do have their own requirements for uh, company registration. EU, it's required, but 
there's uh, a minimum number of criteria around hygiene, sanitation, and some other uh, basic factors. Uh, in the U.S., variety registration is voluntary. Uh, in the EU, it's mandatory. It requires for field crops two years of value conservation and use data and two years distinctiveness, uniformity, and stability data. For vegetables, it's one year distinctiveness, uniformity, stability data. Uh, in the U.S., seed certification is voluntary. Uh, it's up to the owner of the variety to decide if they want to register or their variety or get it certified. It's mandatory for field crops in the EU uh, and uh, voluntary for vegetable crops. And then you see developing countries tend to be uh, on one side or the other with respect to those, the, the US and the EU model. So South Africa, India, Bangladesh, for instance, tend to follow more the US models where it's voluntary uh, registration certification. And in the EU, uh, or uh, in some countries like Turkey, Ukraine, much of Sub-Saharan Africa follows the EU models. And I think you can look at the, w which countries were colonies of which countries in Europe to understand that. So I'm going to pass by the early generation seed. You're going to hear more about that in a minute. So. You know, we are dealing with NARS and seed company capacity issues. Uh, just in the last year, we had a situation where one of the, our NARS uh, lost uh, $400,000 worth of breeder seed because they didn't do their isolation properly. That's an example of the kinds of challenges we have working with the, the National Agriculture Research Systems. This is just a list of some of the things we're doing to try to strengthen uh, the national systems as well as seed companies. So uh, a lot of work through the, the um, consultative group for international ag research, as well as we've got scaling uh, seeds and technologies partnerships with the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. Uh, Partnering for Innovation is doing a lot of work on getting new seed technologies to missions, and we see a lot of missions with their own scaling plans uh, focused on uh, technologies. Finance has been a challenge, continues to be a challenge for, for uh, smallholders and for seed companies. If you look at the, if you just break the challenges into uh, it's their component pieces, farm infrastructure is a real, it, it's an expensive cost and uh, it's one that seed companies have a hard time getting money to do. Uh, finance is uh, not easy just for that kind of expense. Likewise, fixed asset purchases, working capital, uh, especially since it tends to be seasonal, is difficult to finance. Capital equipment uh, is, is another one. And then just smallholder input finance so that smallholders actually have capital money when it's time to purchase inputs uh, and and they're able to, to put the money on the table. So one of the things we see is some of the factors that drive up the seed sector costs, just the environment for finance generally. Capital costs in a lot of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere are very high. Uh, you see 40% maybe in Malawi, 30% interest rates in, in Ghana. So um, in, in those cases, uh, companies aren't going to want to borrow. It's just too expensive. Land tenure, uh, without certain land tenure, you can't use land as collateral in some of these countries. Collateral registries often don't exist or asset registries don't exist. Credit rating agencies uh, in a lot of these uh, countries also don't exist. So, uh, and then there's restrictions on deposits. So just in general, those push up the, the costs of finance. Uh, seed companies, we've, we've talked to a lot of banks and venture uh, entities, and some of the things we hear from them, yes, they're undercapitalized, right? They don't know how to keep their books properly. Also, the, the, their revenue tends to be seasonal. So it's very difficult for, from a, a lender's perspective, to finance seed companies. And then smallholders, just microfinance hasn't done what a lot of people hoped it would do in terms of getting uh, 
uh, fi finance and inputs to smallholders. Um, savings has also been a challenge, but I think there's more that we're seeing happening with savings instruments now for getting, getting capital smallholders. Some of the opportunities going back up, you see, so we've, we've surveyed a lot of seed companies. In fact, this is something that uh, we did just in December. And what we hear overwhelmingly is what they'd really love to get is some kind of line of credit finance. Is it possible to put that kind of financial package together? We don't know. We're exploring. Maybe some people here might have some ideas. Um, if we can get line of credit financing, we might actually be able to get uh, some kind of a DCA to, or a risk share instruments behind it. Uh, Capital equipment is uniquely suited to leasing instruments, and, there's, and that's happening in some places where, for instance, in Zambia, they're uh, doing track. Uh, and then for smallholders, there's, there's something of a push towards maybe mobile savings products is an uh, opportunity, maybe uh, some kinds of saving clubs. So these have been attempted in some countries, but maybe they could be used more effectively for inputs. Uh, and then generally far, farmer awareness building. So uh, last year at the um, African Green Revolution Forum, I had an opportunity to talk to uh, Mike Mack, the CEO of Syngenta. And one of the things he was really wanted to emphasize was farmers aren't going to adopt a, a new variety all at once. They're going to use, they have a, like a 10, 50, 80 rule. They're going to try a variety maybe on 10 percent of their land one year, 50 percent the next, and then if they really like it, they'll go all in up to 80 percent and then keep a little land set aside for some experimentation. We do see that uh, not just in developed countries, but in uh, a lot of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, farmers will experiment, but they need to be aware of the technologies and what, what the benefits are. So some of the things that we're trying to do, and this is not all of this is new, it's been a, a um, considerable investment for us, for Gates, for some other donors, in agri-dealer certification, right? So it's building farmers' assurance that the, the technologies, if they try them, are going to be uh, reliable for you because that's been a real uh, problem for farmers getting fake seeds, right? So uh, enforcement is another issue. And, and there's different approaches to enforcement. So some of it is, you know, in, in the US, we have a truth in labeling approach. And in uh, you know, the EU, it's much more the certification and trying to do a cer assurance through the certification system. They have different enforcement mechanisms depending on how uh, the country is organized. And we're trying to work with country specifically on improving truth and labeling enforcement or uh, enforcement through the registration system. Free seed, there's no such thing. A lot of seed that uh, comes in after a disaster, for instance, is tends not to be the best seeds, right? It's, uh, and then farmers continue to use seeds that's low yielding seeds. Also, there's, a, there's an interesting, um, Tussai, uh, and I can't remember what it's, but it's a seed index that was recently developed by Cornell University. One of the things they're looking at is, is how old are some of the varieties in some of these countries? And what kind of yield is associated with the varieties? And we're seeing in some cases there's, there are varieties floating around in southern Africa that go back to the early 1900s. Yields aren't going to get much better on those. They're not good and they're not going to get better. Uh, and then we're working with um, now more on looking at using mobile and social networks to to build farmers' awareness of variety. So I think with that, I will just turn it over. And this was a uh, study that um, USAID and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation recently co-funded. Uh, Pradeep will tell you about that, but it's particularly dealing with some of the challenges we've had on early generation seeds. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm Pradeep Raval. I work for Monitor Deloitte. And as Mark said, uh, we did this study about three months ago. 
and it was a 12 to 14 week study. And I think the premise of the study was that there's a significant bottleneck to foundation and breeder seeds in sub-Saharan Africa. And the bottlenecks, um, as articulated by, I think, both USAID and BNGF, were that, listen, there is a lot of research being done. We've been funding a lot of research institutions on getting new varieties, but it seems like when we actually see what is being used by the farmers, a lot, a lot of the new varieties that are being researched are not getting commercially used. And we think there's a big challenge and this needs to get fixed. Uh, however, I think interestingly, a lot of donors, depending on who you speak to, uh, tend to take very different approaches to how you solve these bottlenecks, right? There are some who would say that, let's get the private sector involved and let's start incubating private seed companies and get them to do early generation seeds. And that's one approach. And some others say that, no, this is all about biodiversity and we need to actually have a public sector play a greater role. So when we actually came to try to do this investigation, we realized that the conversation in the space typically tends to be pretty lopsided, which is often not based on evidence on the ground. So we said that let's actually do a piece of work that looks at where exactly should private sector be involved in solving this challenge? Are there private sector opportunities at all? And where is it that the public sector has a role to play? Uh, because the commercial economics of doing early generation seeds don't work for the uh, private sector. And I think obviously this is, I'm trying to sort of make it really simplified as to whether this is primarily an economic argument or are there sort of other factors that get into it. But from that extent, I think the study is limited because it looked primarily at economics of doing early generation seeds. And we've come up with some recommendations as to uh, in what context should, you, should governments think about bringing private sector in versus in what context should they actually be mitigating some of the risks and costs of early generation seed production. I think the other thing uh, that the study did was that it, it, for the first time ever, did a lot of work on economics of foundation seed and breeder seed production. And I think one of the big conclusions that we came to as a part of the study is, uh, I don't know if many people realize the business of foundation and breeder seeds is a really small business. Uh, because if you look at the multiplication rates between foundation and breeder foundation to commercial seed, uh, the ratios are pretty bad. So fundamentally, if you were sort of trying to get into the space, I think some of the strategic implications are, should you be setting up new companies that do foundational breeder seeds, or should you be actually asking your private companies to backward integrate and do it? So we, I think based on economics, we've come to some conclusions as well around saying that, what is the size of this business? What is the return on investment? And who in the value chain could actually take on this responsibility? So I'm going to share a few findings from that study today, and please feel free to stop me. This is uh, obviously, uh, a significant study with a lot of economics. I'm not going to go into it today. The, the whole package is available with USAID, but I'm going to spend some time chatting about the key recommendations and how we went about doing it. So I think our starting point, uh, uh, I think most people would be familiar with uh, public goods, private goods, common goods, and club goods, right? And I think from an economics perspective, I think there was a pretty clear framework that already existed, which talks about, I think, using excludability and rivalry. How do you actually think about various goods in the marketplace. And we based our study based on understanding this frame, which is pretty uh, pretty common at a very simplistic level, I think. Uh, private goods are places where there are private sector markets and there's, sort of, there's a demand and there's profitability and you're able to address it. Uh, versus I think public goods is when there's a lot of demand, but there's not money to be made in terms of marginal economic value. And I think these sort of correlate to that. But the reason I'm sort of playing it is this is sort of rooted in conventional economic principles. So we've not, and I know that I think people think that it's pretty radical to look at economics, but it's based on a pretty well understood theory on what are pub public goods and private goods. And we try to apply this theory to seed systems, early generation seed systems. So essentially, um, what we did was we said that um, a lot of times I think there's a discussion as to whether the economics of seed industry, are they determined by policies? And if so, by fixing policies, can you actually address uh, the issues in terms of economics. But in reality, what you've realized was that a lot of fundamental economics and seeds actually depend on the seed varieties themselves, right? Depending on how often would the seed retain its quality over a number of years, right? To things like, uh, for instance, are, uh, is the differentiated yield a good enough value proposition for the farmer to actually buy them versus sort of buying their conventional farm safe seeds or using their farm safe seeds. I think a lot of complex dynamics that go on uh, 
uh, with respect to the economics of seed, which are all not actually dependent on the policy environment. So some of the factors that influence, I think, demand for seed would be things like, what is the underlying uh, commercial value that the farmers could recoup from a particular seed variety? For instance, in legumes in Africa, we know that the commercial markets for legumes is not that good, which translates into incomes being low for the farmers, which then translates into the seeds not being seeds not being as profitable for the farmers to use. Now, I know I'm generalizing because legumes uh, as a category is pretty broad. I think some could argue that I think areas like pigeon peas, you already have significant markets and a lot of traders. But I'm generally trying to make a statement that if you look at certain types of crop types, I think there is a demand issue, right? And then there are other issues where uh, even if you, it's harder to sort of actually invest money in getting hybrids done in certain crops because the crop technologies are pretty hard. And then the other dimension is being that uh, even if you were to generate, even if there was demand for a particular seed variety and if there is actually technology to do it and somebody's cracked it, uh, the reuse usage of seeds over multiple years becomes a bit of a bottleneck. So all these actually contribute to some of the economic issues. So if you look at it, we've actually said that there are four broad market archetypes that you have. Uh, and the two axes that we have are on the y-axis, you have the level of demand for a particular seed. When we say demand, this is monetized demand, right? I mean, I'm trying to make a distinction because uh, if there's demand that farmers need seed, but they can't pay for it, then it's not actually demand, right? So it's the level of monetized demand on one axis. And on the other axis, we've looked at what is the marginal economic value in a particular crop. So in rough sense, this is sort of, is, is there a profitable opportunity for people to engage in seed production or buy seeds in the space? So if you look at it, in there are four broad types of markets here. I think the one which we've ignored for the purpose of the study is the niche area where uh, we said that it's highly, I mean, it's highly uh, profitable, but the demand's really low. These tend to be seed varieties which are used for, for instance, a cassava beer production, right? So because it's a pretty narrow market, right? The demand is not substantially high. It doesn't make sense for a seed company to come and do seed production in that space, but it's still, sort of a worthwhile business to have, but we've ignored it because those are very specialized cases. It's mostly industrial uses of those crops and so on, so we've ignored it. And then that leaves us about three market archetypes. The first one being a private sector market archetype. I mean, this is something that you see with hybrid maize in a lot of markets. And in this archetype, what we're saying is there's a substantial de monetized demand for these seed varieties from the farmers. Uh, and uh, there is actually enough money to be made because the technology yields in certain returns and the economics could be reaped back. So we call that a private sector archetype where I think the recommendations of the study, I'll sort of talk about that, is primarily about trying to drive the early generation seeds in the space by getting private sector involved. So in case of the governments are investing in these spaces, then actually that's a wrong answer. It's a wasteful resource investments. Uh, the second one is a public sector one where we're saying that uh, you actually have the level of monetized demand being pretty low and the profitability, profitability being pretty low. I think these are places where these could be food security crops that don't have commercial values. Farmers are net effectively not making incomes. But I mean, there are some examples like sorghum here, OPVs, this common beans, um, which actually fall into this category. And where we said that these are public sector archetypes. So we need actually public sector to play a significant role in early generation seeds uh, from end to end. And mind you, when we're talking about public sector as private sector, we're talking primarily about financing. We're not talking about operations. I'll, I'll, I'll come to it, which I'm saying that I think if, if this seeds have to be, early generation seeds have to be funded, then it has to be funded by public sector because there's no commercial opportunity. But they, you could see a situation where the public sector could fund it with the private sector actually operating it, right? But I think these archetypes are fundamentally regarding financing. And the third archetype, which we call as public-private collaborations, is places where I think there's a business case, but not quite, right? I think a lot of the commodities actually fall in these in these areas where you require public investment to offset some of the risk for the private investment or offset some of the costs. And there are actually two types of archetypes in public-private. I think we've seen some places where there's a significant supply side investment that is required in some of these seed systems. So it's a supply side risk mitigation uh, versus in other cases, there's actually demand which, is, um, demand which is pretty low. So I think all the public investment that comes into the space should be about sprucing up demand so that the economics of the stuff works. So we've actually separated them out. And we've started plotting, I think, what are the different crops that fall into the space. 
and also it's 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 interesting i think we've gone back and forth as to whether uh, is it fair to say that hybrid maze is always a private archetype now because for instance i think in a market like zambia where we've seen that markets are fairly privatized and private sector actually have significant opportunity this applies but i think depending on how the policy environment as it stands today exists that hybrid maze today might not actually be in the private sector archetype but the government should seek to move them towards that direction as we move forward so um, this in summary is probably the recommendation as to where should people get involved. If you look at it, I mean, these are pretty dense slides, I understand. So on the y-axis, we actually have the whole seed value chain starting from variety and research and development to marketing and distribution of seed, right? And these are sort of the, uh, the breeder seed uh, production and maintenance and found in foundation seed production are the places where the study focused on. So what we tried doing is, now, based on a detailed understanding of the economics of foundation and breeder seeds in these different archetypes, we start, started to overlay as to where should the public sector be involved and the private sector be involved from a financing perspective. As you would see, uh, in the public sector archetype, we think that almost everything needs to be public sector, except for the research which is um, done by NARCs or sometimes it is sort of private research institutions that are being funded by the foundations or USAID, which can actually do this piece of work, but it's largely a public sector driven play, right? In the private sector driven play, we think that there are economics that make it worthwhile for the private sector to do almost everything in this space, right? Barring perhaps, I think, variety research and development, because we haven't actually done the economics of it. Sometimes I think the economics of researching new varieties is so hard that somebody might not be able to recoup the investments. So we've not looked at those economics, so we've actually left it as something that Potentially, you still need the national research institutions to work with the private sector. But broadly, we, what we've done is on the private sector archetype, almost everything is done by the private sector. In the two archetypes, which is the public-private archetype one and two, as you see, we've actually identified places where it makes sense for, for a public sector to come and partner with private sector and what those opportunities are. And it's pretty sort of intuitive from the previous slide, which is that in places where there's a huge supply side investment to be made, to do this, I think we need the government to come in and help on the supply side versus, I think, in the archetype where there's, there's more sort of demand side issues, I think we want sort of the public sector to come in, offset risks and costs and actually marketing the seed and so on. So, so what, what does all of this mean and why is this uh, so interesting from our perspective is that today, I mean, the resources are pretty constant constrained, right? I mean, every government has only a fixed amount of resources to invest in seed systems. And sometimes I think as policy may, as uh, people are advocating for policy changes or people are actually doing work in the seed systems area, don't actually tend to give guidance to the governments and saying that if you were to make a relative allocation of resources across these different types of seed archetype, where would you actually put your money, right? And why should you do that, right? And, and often, it's a hard conversation to have because it is your view versus my view, right? Because uh, often these conversations tend to be value judgment based and value centric rather than actually being on fundamental rationale. So I think what we've done is this provides a very effective framework for uh, the development community to take to uh, the various governments and have a candid conversation as to let's see as to what are the big crops that you prioritize as, as part of your national agenda. And let's help you think through, if you were to make investments in early generation seeds, where would you actually do that? And then let them actually ease policies in some places where they shouldn't actually be intervening as government. So for instance, in the private sector area, the most recommendations that we had in that archetype is to uh, remove any market distortions that you're creating by putting in money. Because by putting in money, you're disincentivizing private sector from actually coming and doing work in that space. And in fact, your chances are much better if you step back and I think some of the things that we spoke about are transitioning out from playing a direct role in those value chains for the government, removing distortionary subsidies in some cases, um, and making sure that the markets are able to work. And for donors, it is about demonstrating the profit potential to some of the private players, right? So for instance, today you would go to a private sector player and give them a working capital grant uh, to make sure that they're starting it. But then if that private sector fundamentally doesn't have the economic case of doing it, then it'll anyway fail after you step back. But if they have, if they can do it, then you're putting money where you don't need to put in. So we think that the donors should substantially focus their efforts on demonstrating to the private sector that there's an economic case and there's a profit potential in this space. Um, think about potentially uh, addressing some of the high fixed cost issues by talking about some of the financing that we spoke about, 
right? Can you actually think about getting markets to finance these companies so that they could move it? Because the money could be recouped. The return of investment is there. The upfront capital investment might be hard. And sometimes I think thinking about the capacity in banking sector to be able to do that. In the public sector, I think we said that this is fundamentally about improving the efficiency of existing systems to make sure that you're able to get things out of the research institutions to the commercial seed pretty quickly. And I think some of the things that the governments could think about, depending on their biases as to how they want to run their economy, could be, for instance, can you completely do public funded, private owned uh, breeding and foundation seeds in these markets? And that's a pretty radical idea. I don't think every government needs to do that. But I think the thing that we're trying to say is here, you need to fund a lot of it. And you need to sort of think about where is it that you need to fund? How do you improve the responsiveness? How do you set up the right incentives for your public institutions to do this job effectively? I think those recommendations are broadly centered around that. In the public sector and the public-private partnership archetype, uh, one which is mitigating demand risk, uh, these advanced purchase commitments could be a great idea. right? I know a lot of people talk about it, but where do you actually apply? So for instance, we know that there's a case. We know that somebody needs to take the risk for demand. Then can the public sector come in or the donors come in and saying that we're going to underwrite some of the demand risk uh, that exists for you today? Uh, because I think if you look at it, I think it's a reasonably good bet to make in this space because we think that once you kickstart the process, I think there's going to be a commercially viable business as long as the demand risk is being mitigated and some of the training costs are being funded. And mostly we sort of see the roles for public and private sector in that space. And I think in places where there's a significant production cost for foundation breeder season, and these are sort of dependent on things like isolation rates being high. Sometimes I think availability of contiguous land to be able to do this might be harder. I think we said that some of the supply, supply side incentives and subsidies might be helpful to kickstart the process from a public sector perspective, which then will sort of move the chains forward. Anyway, that's sort of broadly, I think, what we tried coming up with. Um, and as we said, I think I didn't go into the detailed economics of doing each, because we've looked at about uh, four markets and looked at multiple value chains and looked at the economics of it to come up with conclusions. Obviously, I think this, this can't be implemented the way it is. And I think some of the work that will be done going forward is to take this framework and it becomes a topic, a basis for a conversation with the governments to help them design their own plans, but with the understanding that not all seeds are ripe for private investment. And there are places where the public sector needs to get involved. And even if you're collaborating, I think it needs to be based on a good understanding of the underlying economics. Great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Full slides, and I think um, I, I definitely want to review them myself. Lots of dense text, so they'll be up on um, the AgriLinks event page for this seminar. Um, it should be later this afternoon if anyone wants to be able to download the slides um, and review them. And so, uh, quickly, uh, before we get into the Q&A period, we will have a Charlie Doom um, from, uh, from USAID and Ag. Uh, foreign Service Officer going over seed trade harmonization in Africa. And um, I'll figure out how I, I can advance the slides, yes? You can do it from back here? Back there? Okay, great. All right, so we should be hearing Charlie's voice momentarily. Thank you for introducing me. Um, thank you to everyone. It's very humbling to be speaking to this audience because as I'm looking through the participant list on the webinar, I see several of the folks that are architects and authors of the policy and strategy, um, strategies that I'll be discussing um, and referencing throughout my presentation. Quickly, I'll be just providing a little bit of information on the seed supply and demand situation in Comesa. Comesa is the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, and it reaches from Egypt and Libya down to Madagascar and Zimbabwe. And it's where the East Africa USAID mission focuses its seed policy efforts. Um, I'll also then talk about our collective USAID efforts to harmonize seed policy not only in East Africa, but also in Southern Africa and West Africa. So if we can advance to the second slide. Um, Right now, in the Comesa region, we produce roughly 500,000 metric tons of seed each year against a demand of more than 2 million metric tons of advanced seed. Um, the number one frustration that is shared with us routinely by farmers 
and formally in um, questionnaires is that they want greater access to improved seed varieties. Um, on top of the perennial issue of finding quality seed, uh, we have issues in the region, including the spread of maize lethal necrosis disease, uh, that is uh, seed-borne uh, plant disease, that are causing seed supply to further decrease and causing uh, supply issues. For most of Eastern and Southern Africa, most seed comes from Zambia and Southern Africa, which causes some issues with countries that have trouble uh, trading with Zambia and Southern Africa. Next, talking a little bit about the seed harmonization process in Comesa, we have Lloyd LePage uh, participating in, in the webinar today, and he's actually asking a lot of questions and um, providing a lot of thought-provoking discussion in, in the chat session. But he's been following this for a long time, but for more than, I think, 20 years, we've been trying to harmonize seed policy I'm seeing in the chat box that you guys can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Are you able to hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, again, back to a 20 year history of trying to harmonize seed policy in Comesa. Um, fortunately, in 2014, Comesa was finally successful through the specialized agency ACTASA, or the Alliance for Commodity Trade in Eastern and Southern Africa, in gazetting the policy, which is their process for passing a harmonized seed policy. I've shared the uh, COMESA seed trade harmonization regulations uh, with the webinar, so if you want to download those, um, if you want to download those, you can. Um, in short, what the harmonized regulations provide for is a streamlined process to access the whole of the COMESA market. Whereas before harmonization, if you were a seed company that was trying to introduce a seed variety in any of the countries in the 19 member states of COMESA, you had to do it one by one. So if you wanted five countries, access to five countries, you had to go through the regulatory process in all five countries. Now, with the benefit of the past policy, if you are able to have a variety released in two countries, it's then released in all 19 countries. What this does is it lowers the cost of business and makes um, the value prop proposition for seed companies much more predictable. Uh, Pradeep mentioned that seed varieties, in many cases, get shelved. And what we expect with the access created by the seed, harmonized seed policy is that more of the varieties where the value proposition wasn't high enough um, to commercialize them, they'll now be more interesting for folks um, in more countries and therefore pulling more of those varieties from the lab and from the testing field to farmers that are actually interested in producing uh, varied and improved varieties. Speaking specifically about um, how to implement this policy, once we pass a policy, that's the end of the beginning. Um, just having a policy in place isn't enough. You've actually got to follow that up with a lot of activities to nationalize and domesticate that policy. And USAID funded in 2014 the creation of what's called COMSHIP, or the COMESA Seed Harmonization Implementation Plan. And through this document, we enumerated all of the activities that we thought were necessary to fully implement in all 19 member states of COMESA this seed harm, the regulated seed harm, excuse me, seed harmonization uh, policy. Uh, again, I shared ComShip with all of you. It has four main strategic objectives, and I'll only reference one because I just have a few minutes to talk with you today. And the first one is to prepare for and support phase domestication. And that has several sub-elements within it, but primary to that is the National Seed Act alignment in each of the member states. Um, both USAID, DFID, and other donors are supporting um, the updating and alignment of each of those seed acts so that they can 
uh, support national level national level implementation of um, the harmonized policy. This also supports a variety release systems. So uh, AGRA has funded a variety release catalog, which would convey to the market what varieties have been um, released in two or more countries. And it also standardizes and improves quarantine and phytosanitary related activities. So when I first started talking about the idea of regional harmonization, I referenced more than 20 years of historical efforts to harmonize the policy. Um, I've only been involved with this for about two years myself, but what helped make it, m this process succeed this time was the partici participation of both the private sector as well as civil society. So the African Seed Trade Association, or AFTA, was a key contributor and participant in bringing along with it the seed trade associations of the various member states as well as private sector partners to the conversation and to improve um, the dialogue and ensure that the regulations were actually relevant to the marketplace. And also, by bringing in civil society, um, you bring in more diverse conversation and um, uh, dialogue around the sovereignty of farmers. Next, just forgive me. Um, what are the benefits of harmonization? Why, why did USAID invest in this? Why are other donors concerned? And what's the benefit to the smallholder farmer? We had, or it's our hypothesis that if you provide farmers with access to improved seed varieties, their productivity and food security will improve. Seed is the first limiting factor of production. If you're planting a seed variety that has a maximum production potential of 100 units, no matter how perfectly timed rains might be, no matter how well soil fertility is managed, or how pests are controlled, 100 units is going to remain the production ceiling. And if you provide access to farmers to a seed variety that has, say, 120 or 130 units of production, um, that's the ceiling that they're working with. And the same on the downside. Um, if you have a higher production potential, um, if you have poor rains, if you have poor soil fertility, if you have suboptimal um, pest control, you're still going to have a higher yielding um, season at the end of all of whatever maladies you may endure. Um, one of the things that often comes up when we're talking about the benefits is the concern over the price of seed to the farmer. And I also saw a lot of dialogue in the um, chat box asking about um, making sure that the farmers are able to access the seed. This is something that I look forward to discussing in, in greater depth in other platforms, but um, I talk about having a market-based price for seed. In various geographies, um, seed has to be priced at different levels so that it's relevant to that market. Um, and in some cases, it's subsidized, in others, it's not. Um, maize being a great example of uh, where farmers are able to see the market value and, and often pay a lot more for seed, whereas something like cowpea or um, pigeon pea, the, the market value of investing in improved seed isn't as clear to the farmer. They're not willing to make um, that gam gamble. Anyway, this uh, conversation leads into my second highlighted benefit of seed policy harmonization, and that's that you increase the opportunities for seed companies um, to participate more widely and to benefit um, more from a more sophisticated marketplace. So if you can predict your cost of production and your cost of disseminating a variety across a larger uh, geography, you can obviously draw more benefit from that. Um, in, in addition to being able to predict the cost of variety release, um, through ComShip, um, the general cost to seed business will decrease. Um, this is from greater mutual recognition of testing um, that we expect to be achieved. Um, the time and cost of transiting seed across borders will also decrease, lowering the cost of doing business. The certification process and even labeling, um, as well as mutual recognition of quarantine test lists again, improves the efficiency of the market. Finally, last slide. Um, so I've talked only about COMESA today, but there are seed programs that are also active in the static region of the Southern Africa region, as well as ECOWAS in West Africa. And just this month, um, there was a tripartite 
agreement that was signed between COMESA, SADC, and EAC. There are no discussions at this time um, that, are, that are advanced on including uh, harmonized tripartite seed policy. But in the next months and years, I expect that that will be um, a priority issue for the, the tripartite free trade area. With that, I will turn it back to Washington. Uh, great, thank you, Charlie. Um, why don't we give a round of applause to our three presenters? All right, so we can open the floor for Q&A, and I'd also like to call your attention just to a few key takeaways that we placed on this slide uh, to keep them at the front of your brain. Uh, but we we have you know a good solid amount of time for questions and answers, so I hope that you'll dig in, um, and we'll alternate kind of back and forth between the in-person and online audience. Um, starting with the in-person room. So if anyone has a question or a comment or example to share, please raise your hand. In the back there. All right. um, and if you don't mind, please state your name and organization. Well, I'm Dennis Garretti, uh, former director general at the World Agroforestry Center and uh, currently senior fellow at uh, World Resources Institute and, and, and NICRAP as well. And I wanted to um, uh, take a look at uh, the remarks, I believe it's uh, Prabhula? Pradeep, uh, yeah. Uh, Pradeep uh, made uh, about uh, the, the types of uh, um, sectoral approaches in seed systems and to bring a little more focus to uh, the role of trees uh, and tree seed systems in this whole universe of, of options. Because uh, we've been trying to uh, actually emphasize the fact that um, um, as um, trees and agroforestry become hugely more important for many reasons in Africa and other continents, uh, there's an enormous problem with tree seed systems as well. In fact, much greater constraints because there's been almost no attention to them. But USAID invested in um, privatizing um, the National Tree Seed Center in Malawi about a decade ago, and it was a huge success. Uh, however, it's probably the only example of, uh, that I know of of, of really uh, a, a serious attempt to uh, probably apply the public-private model that you mentioned, where uh, it was a public sector institution. It was privatized into a trust, which is now it operates as a private business, but it's technically a uh, parastatal. And, um, and, and these kinds of models have enormous potential. So what I wanted to do was to bring the tree woody perennial side into the equation and hope that monitor Deloitte, uh, USAID in general, can start to think about the enormous potential of building uh, on successes and um, opportunities to, uh, to really invest in the tree seed systems as well. Thank you. Well, just as a response, we, know we, we didn't look at tree seed systems. Fruit, I mean, we didn't really look at vegetables very much. We didn't really look at, at fruit at all. So that would be a, a something to do in the future. Uh, and it would be interesting to see how some of the characteristics line up with the, the archetype. Um. But do we have a, an online question that we can throw in before we come back here? Great. Apologies for that. We have a very active online community today with folks coming in all the way from Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, within our own country, the US, from all over, and from Ireland as well. I'm sure lots more countries that weren't mentioned. Uh, lots of discussion about this presentation. One question from Lloyd LePage is, how can we encourage policy shifts that increase demand for improved seed? Where there is demand, private sector can find ways and finance to meet demand. So what are your thoughts and um, reactions to his question and thought? I think it's a it's an interesting question because uh, we've looked at some of the economics of training um, and um, actually sprucing up demand. I think one of the challenges that you would discover in more sort of smallholder contexts is that uh, not often do the cost of actually training and demand generation and uh, and 
extension can be recovered by private companies in the short term, right? So that actually raises an interesting uh, problem for private companies where, uh, yes, I think we see a long-term demand question, but the economics in the short term and the way my shareholders measure me, my success is not aligned with, I think, the way I'm able to actually invest in it. So um, the question is, is there a way, in, for instance, we're actually looking at interesting models in other sectors like viability gap financing where for instance a donor actually comes in and funds some of the activity but uh, it's a reimbursable grant that the private sector could then pay back once the demand of the market could move up so i think there's a lot of work to be done in understanding as to what are the interesting ways in which some of the extension and training could be funded but i think it's it's going to be hard for the private sector to do it uh, with the state of agriculture today as it stands in the fragmentation that exists because the costs are just too high Hi, I'm uh, Peter Boone from Karana Corporation, Vice President there. I'd like to address a question to Charlie uh, and maybe the others will come in too. Um, Charlie, uh, in your presentation of the new seed harmonization treaty in COMESA, um, I was curious, uh, you know, a lot of times COMESA or ECOWAS or or um, SADEP will have a free or trade treaty or regulation in place, often for free flow of agricultural goods and others. And there's often, at least in the first few years after that treaty, a gap between what's on paper as a free trade or automatic registration or free trade opportunity. There's a big gap between what's supposed to happen and what actually happens. And so for the uh, seed treaty to work, obviously, um, you know, national registration uh, should be automatic once you've registered in two countries, but it may not always work that way. Or at the cut, at, you know, at the border level, customs officials may not be up to date on the, on the new treaty requirements and may hold the seeds or, or tax them or, or other things. So, I was wondering what USAID and the other donors and, and COMESA would do to really operationalize this and, and what obstacles you might see. Are there, are there vested interests in the public research institutes to, to want to get those $30,000 a year from doing trials? Or how do you overcome those practical constraints to this nice you know, policy? Uh, Charlie first, but maybe the others will, will tune in. Hi, Peter. Thank you for your question. It's nice to hear a familiar voice uh, out in Washington. Um, so on your question about how, how quickly something like um, the seed regulations will actually go um, into force, ComShip was developed as a five to seven year plan. And it's our hope that in that time span, there would be full implementation and full adoption. So once the regulations were gazetted, they were fully in force. So if someone wanted to question, um, wanted to question whether or not that, you know, if a variety was released in two countries and bring that to Comesa's arbitration court, they could. Um, a private sector partner is interested in actually testing that and may provide some funding for that. But aside from really testing the process in, in that manner, right now USAID is working with other donors to implement uh, ComShip. Right now it's uh, primarily been USAID and DFID as well as AGRA. And we've launched uh, ComShip initiatives in 13 countries this year. Uh, starting in starting in January, and the remaining countries are um, ones where there's not a lot of seed trade anyway. We're talking about Comoros, Mauritius, uh, Seychelles, uh, also Libya, um, and a few others. But the the primary countries where we do have predominant seed trade do have programs launched, and they're at varying um, uh, places in uh, adopting and aligning. Uh, new uh, seed acts and also adopting the various elements of ComShip. Uh, the seed catalog should be live in the next few months. And once that um, is operationalized, that I think is going to be 
the most critical element of being able to communicate to the private sector and the public sector that um, seed harmonization in COMESA is actually happening. Um, again, it was passed in, in early 2000, in February 2014. It's now 2015, and we aren't talking about varieties that are actually regionally introduced. So um, it's not an instant process. It does require um, continuous follow-up. We're also doing, um, USAID is also sponsoring a mutual accountability process as we're implementing ComShip to ensure that we're actually making forward progress on the implementation of um, the harmonized uh, rules. The same thing is happening in ECOWAS with the West Africa Seed Program where they're doing a mutual account accountability process to ensure uh, full implementation across the region. Um, this is Pradeep. I'd like to weigh in with the separate perspective because I think it's complementary, but it's not divergent from what Charlie is saying. Uh, I think one of the big challenges for mostly uh, implementing any policies or harmonization policies is just the capacity of institutions and the government in general and local markets, right? And I think we've done a lot of private sector investment work in processing, for instance, and investments. I think those are sort of slightly different because obviously there is no issues such as registration and ensuring that you're protecting the plant material and biodiversity. I think such complications don't come, but uh, irrespective of it, we've looked at institutions and the strength of institutions and the uh, processes that they have in the capacities. And often, I think that tends to be a big weak link uh, in actually implementing stuff. Uh, so it's probably a topic for another day. I think there's a lot of conversation around how do you build institutions that are sustainable in these markets that can actually rally around some of these policies, both which are national as well as regional. And I wouldn't ignore that in addition to actually working and harmonizing things across, because that tends to be a big bottleneck as well. Just adding to that, uh, you know, in, in some of these countries, the, the spirit exists, but the reality is not quite the same. Uh, in ECOWAS, we see uh, situations where some of the countries haven't actually gazetted the laws themselves so that uh, they're really not in compliance with the international trade agreements, and they won't be until they've gazetted them. And they, I guess, feel like they don't have to hurry to do that. Uh, however, there is uh, what you'd say a coalition of the willing, and some countries are actually allowing uh, early generation and uh, other you know, older generation seeds to cross borders. Uh, we've actually just uh, gotten parent lines moved uh, breeder seed move from uh, Burkina and Mali to Senegal. So, uh, small steps. We'll take a question from I can jump in again, just recognizing the second part of Peter's question about obstacles and hearing Pradeep and, and Mark talk. MLND for the maize value chain is one thing that I see as being a major obstacle in allowing um, the, the harmonized seed policy to actually go in force because when you've got a, a seed borne vector like MLND um, or an, a suspected seed borne uh, vector like MLND, then that can cause countries to really shut down and, and shy away from something like um, harmonized policy. And second to that, to kind of to Pradeep's point, in talking about um, the capacity at a country level. Um, we're working with sea trade associations in, in several countries That's kind of the um, in, in uh, informally partnering with Gates. And through that, realizing that the transparency um, in how to release a variety in various countries is very different and very um, uh, changeable based on the organization, whether it be a public or private company that's trying to introduce seed varieties. And so um, through the implementation of ComShip, we're seeing um, ways to resolve some of the transparency issues and hopefully improve the transparency. Well, I would like to go back to a point I made earlier that is there's a lot of varieties. Maize is a very good example. Uh, that have, we'll call them zombie varieties. They're, they continue to exist. Nothing can kill them. They're not productive. They aren't going to yield more than half a ton a hectare anymore. Uh, and 
in the interests of food security, we would like to see farmers adopting higher yielding varieties. Uh, so to the extent that trade will allow better technologies, and it doesn't have to be hybrids, it can be OPVs, but it would be nice to see the average age of the varieties that have been released in a country to become less than 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, which is the, same, the case in some countries. So uh, on a, from the, the perspective of a food security interest, we would want to see more trade of better adopted varieties. Maybe one of the downside risks is that some varieties move to some uh, at inappropriate agroclimatic zones. Um, this is where it is important for us to inform and educate farmers. I think the seed catalogs are one way to help keep the information flowing. It doesn't solve the problem of farmers getting a variety that may not be appropriate for their particular agroclimate. Um, there has to be a lot of education that goes with that. Um, very often that is a public sector role. Uh, but private sector companies, if properly incentivized, will also play that role. I just want to build on that. I mean, I, I have a pretty radical view on what private sector should be doing. I think they fundamentally should uh, use capital the most efficient way that they could and actually make money, right? And the question is, sometimes when private sector pursues the objectives, which is primarily about return for shareholders in the long term, it creates unintended consequences like biodiversity issues, wrong seed varieties, consumers not being protected. And I sort of tend to view that as a cost question and who's actually able to tax such bad behavior so that we're able to protect it. So often when we do the trade uh, harmonization, I think in general it's good because it expands markets, expands access. Uh, but then there's also needs to be guide rails for how that's going to work. And sometimes just relying on the conscience of private sector is not going to address it. So I think there is a big role that uh, governments, regional commissions have, regional sort of cooperative corporations and organizations have a role to play in actually setting up those guide rails. It's going to be a learning experience. There are going to be unintended consequences in the short term. But the question is, can we have a system that uh, effectively adapts to this over a period of time? And how do we do that is the key. Um, I just add that uh, the, the question assumes that this isn't happening now, right? There is a lot of informal movement of seeds across borders. And some of it to appropriate places and some to inappropriate places. And farmers do suffer from inadequate information now. And there's not enforcement of uh, uh, varietal registration now. So in, in some respects, the, it is a reality. But, but it's very much in the informal sector. And we don't know a lot about it. Thank you. I think that was a great and very thorough answer. Um, all right, so we'll pass one over here. Thanks. I'm David Spielman from the International Food Policy Research Institute. Thanks very much for, for three interesting presentations. This is a great topic. I think it's been very comprehensive in how you've um, covered it. I think a lot of the solutions that, that you're suggesting here, these top takeaways, for instance, are a lot about increasing demand, but more importantly, increasing supply, right? You know, shifting out of both curves by improving extension and awareness among farmers and reducing the costs and risks associated with seed production and early generation seed. But I guess it's an obvious point that, that maybe we should make is that the demand for seed is derived from the demand for the end product crop itself, right? And, and unless there's a lot of value addition and product diversification and whatnot going on in that commodity sector, especially for crops like maize in Africa, I imagine that the returns to higher yielding varieties are going to still be fairly limited when you know the surpluses are, are, are so limited from, from food insecure households and so on. So you know you get the picture there. It's an obvious point, but I think it, it does need to be made that so much more needs to happen, right? Um, but actually, I have I have a sort of a wider interest. It goes back to the question that was asked online. It's about these political economy issues that we really I think need to think about a little deeper. Maybe you could give some comments. One, one, of the, one of the big issues that I see is the continued 
role of state-owned enterprises and parastatals. I mean, the best example is the leading hybrid maize producer in Kenya, right? Kenya Seed Enterprise. In 2009, there was actually a Supreme Court case to determine whether it was a state-owned enterprise or not, because no one was sure, because ministers and others held shares in it. And they felt that they actually had private shares. But it wasn't. It's a, it's a state-owned company. And it is the largest producer. It has, what, 85% of the market for hybrid maize seed. And it's an exporter to Uganda and Tanzania, right? And so it's effectively crowding out private sector development. Yet donors and Agra and, and, and others continue to work very closely with the Kenya Seed Enterprise because it is the best way to reach farmers with uh, new hybrids. So, so what do you do in a case like that? The case in Ethiopia is even more acute, where they created not one, but many state-owned enterprises for seed. Um, and then on the other side, of course, you know, these are generally not competitive markets. Seed, you know, when you're a seed company, you're trying to create uh, monopolistic competition, right? You're trying to create a distinct product that differentiates you from your competitor. Pioneer and Monsanto do it with specific varieties um, or biotech applications or whatever it may be. And a lot of those companies use regulatory barriers to keep out smaller companies that can't afford to get over the hurdles. So there's a potential, despite harmonization for more regulation. In fact. There's, a, there's a potential for less competition in many of these markets. How do you see that forming in the future? I just have to take that because I come from India and I think India has had a pretty, depending on who you ask, a pretty dark or a bright history of having Paris Street was actually uh, uh, being operational for the first 40 years in the economy. So I think there's a long-term answer to your question and there's a short-term answer to your question. Uh, I think in general, from a long-term perspective, the realities of the markets are going to catch up because if you look at it from a macro perspective, Africa is going to be the food hub for the world. That's the only place where there's a significant, I mean, for instance, Southeast Asia, the productivity levels are reaching the maximum. There's no additional land that technically could come to four because it's a pretty intensive cropping situation. So if you look at it broadly over the next 20, 30 year period, which is pretty long, I think I sort of expect Africa to be a significant part of actually driving global uh, food, uh, commodity, trade, and so on. And, and that becomes sort of really important because I think fundamentally there's going to be a big economic case for private sector to come in increasingly. And then uh, you can't actually stop people from coming in because the commodity prices would go up if the systems remain constrained the way they are, which then creates greater and greater incentive for people to come in, right? But I think, but I think the question is, what is your transition plan there? And I think every country has a different way of thinking about what those transition plans are. And often, I think those are not always uh, rational decisions. And sometimes there's a political economy and there are incentive questions that exist. Right Now, the question is that you can actually work around those. For instance, I think in India, a lot of seed um, systems were controlled by state-owned enterprises and licensed, licensed for a really long time. In fact, it actually, I was speaking to the head of Mahiko Seeds in India, which is a great example. They, they thought that it was a great idea for India because it protected a lot of local seed companies in the long term and you're not allowing the big private seed companies to come in. It sort of helped them because it created them the space to grow. Uh, you need to sort of think about, I mean, for instance, I've lived in the Middle East where the Paris trade has actually drive a lot of interesting development, especially in oil and gas and the clusters around them. So I feel like uh, there's no straightforward answer. You raise a pretty complicated issue, but I think there are ways to work around it as long as long-term promise for uh, a particular sector actually is there the room gets bigger and bigger, the more constrained you keep it, right? For instance, in India, all that they had to do in 91 is to change a couple of laws on licensing, market just opened up, right? So I'm more hopeful and optimistic. I'm, I'm only saying is that there's no one single answer, but I think you would be amazed as to how much the markets can actually influence it if you keep it constrained for too long, which I think these countries are doing right now. Boy. I mean, so Kenya, you gave the Kenya example. What's going to change that? It's really difficult to say, right? I mean, other than the markets grow and there's a growing pie and there's, there's more people with more interests uh, making more money out of a, a slightly improved situation. I think what we've tried to do with this, this study is to um, say, what's the trade-offs? And let's be clear about those trade-offs, right? Okay, if, if Kenya's seed company is going to be uh, investing in maize and dominating the maize market, all right, that's a, 
that's a trade-off that they are making, not getting maybe sorghum or millet or one of these other crops that are very uh, important for food security. They're, they're just not going. That's not going to happen. It's not those varieties aren't going to improve. They're not going to get the seeds out. Let's be clear at least what the trade-offs are as part of that conversation. We have time for a few more questions. Do we have one more from the online audience? Definitely. So from Michelle Wen, the agricultural at the Agricultural Transformation Agency in Ethiopia asks, what do you see as the role of local private entities versus MNC private entities? How do they best work together if the local sector is very low scale? Well, so just not very long ago, uh, we were taking a really hard look at what what could the what's the likely scenario for Africa? How is it going to look in 15 years? Uh, you know, acquisitions are going to happen. We've seen it happening. You know, MRI seeds in in Zambia. Uh, there's going to be a lot of acquisitions. There's going to be a lot of uh, big seed companies uh, and then a lot of what we call last mile seed companies. Uh, and those last mile seed companies are going to be really important to getting uh, improved varieties to smallholders. Uh, and there will be some niche, you know, certain kinds of vegetables, whatever. There will be so it, it'll it's the market's not going to look the same as it does now. Uh, if if we accept that that's how the market's going to look, and you know if that's how what's happened in almost every other country in the world um, or region, uh, then you know for us, I guess as donors, it it really puts emphasis on. We've got to have strong last mile seed companies, but we're not going to stop the acquisitions from happening. And really, it's it's um, you know, it's something that we would want to see as a way of getting costs down so that farmers can access technologies more cheaply than they can now. I think in general, like sort of farming is more efficient than small scale farming, large scale capital. Enterprises are actually more efficient than small scale, unless I think there are sort of specific conditions like, for instance, you have access to technology that makes it pretty interesting. In general, I think all things remaining equal, I think large scale companies tend to deploy capital better and are more efficient, which is actually a more efficient economic activity in the economy. The question, however, is that most of these large scale companies tend to be abroad. So there are sort of real implications from an economy perspective. As if you're getting MNCs to do all your activity, then where does the wealth actually go? because there's a significant exchequer conversation, there's a fiscal conversation that governments have. So for instance, China has done an incredible job on mandating joint ventures with local enterprises uh, from a capacity building perspective in the long term, uh, with the view that I think local companies are gonna get more and more efficient and larger and get are able to start their own businesses going forward. So I think there are interesting models to think about how do you actually get local companies to build capacity while ensuring that the economy continues to develop by getting in some of these large companies. The other models that we've seen are, for instance, I think Middle East, uh, Saudi Aramco and uh, Sabic, which is a large petrochemical company, actually grows all the local industries and supply chains of petrochem downstream. And there's an incubation that large companies do around their supply chains because manually intensive small scale industries are much more harder for them to plug uh, for large firms, but large firms actually reap benefits from small firms actually working in those clusters. So. There are ways to actually have large companies and small companies coexist. And uh, I don't think we should be shying away from large investment because it is good. But I think the question is, how do you ensure that you're able to have sustainable economic development through local enterprises in the long term? And that's something that there are interesting models and successful models that are available from many parts of the world. And just going back to the study, you know, some of these, some crops aren't going to get any attention from the companies because they're not profitable. or they're only going to be um, further developed, further improved with um, the right kind of government incentives. So uh, we do need to be concerned that that some important food security crops aren't just abandoned and there's no seed companies interested in them and the government wants to back out of them, right? So it's, uh, 
we do have to keep our eye on uh, some of these crops that have less commercial potential. Um, since we're starting to run out towards both of our, our end of time, why don't we take two questions in a row and then we can, uh, can answer those. Good morning. I'm Paul Randolph with GRM Features Group from the Center Director for Governance and Food Security. Uh, one of the presentations mentioned that there's 500,000 metric tons of seed produced and a demand of 2 million metric tons a year. I was wondering, in your research and, and interactions, has there been much discussion of uh, uh, counterfeit seeds or mislabeled seeds and illicit trade of seeds? And how does that affect that? Charlie had the slide. Do you want to answer, Charlie? Do you want to wait for the second question, or I can just jump in? Okay, Dick Tinsley, Colorado State University. Uh, just a quick point here that uh, 2 million demand only serves about 40 million hectares. And there's a lot more in there. I mean, you're thinking about 25 pounds per hectare, and it's going to, or 25 kilos per hectare. Okay, am I on the air? Okay, my question is we've talked about private sector, we've talked about public sector. How about the NGO sector? that are working directly with smallholder communities, and what role do they have in facilitating the link of getting quality seed into smallholder communities and avoid, to get back to somebody else's comment, growing Mexipac, an Norman Borlaug cross that will predate Simit that has also grown extensively in Afghanistan to this day. So Charlie, Charlie, would you like to chime in first? Sure. I had some difficulty hearing, but I think that the question was about the reference to the 500,000 metric tons of demand right now, and that's a figure that comes from the International Seed Federation. It's actually a 2012 number, so it's a little bit old. And then the second part of the question was about counterfeit seed and the research that's been done in that. And I actually think Pradeep might be better suited to answer this question because I believe Monitor Deloitte was the firm that was contracted to conduct a study by Gates Foundation specifically on counterfeit um, in, in Africa. Pradeep, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I'm happy to talk about counterfeiting. I mean, we've actually done a study which looked at counterfeiting seeds and uh, the loss of, lost economic value because of that. And, I think the estimates actually, I mean, it's hard to sort of pin down the data, but the estimates are anywhere between 30 and 50 percent, depending on the time of the year that you're looking at, that they tend to be counterfeiting seed, seed in, a, in a lot of markets. Um, and it's a big problem. And we've, we've looked at, I think, what are ways to address uh, some of the counterfeiting issues, because um, you fundamentally have an issue where the farmers are not able to discern the quality between a good seed and bad mm -hmm. seed. You actually have a motivated agro dealers in some cases to make more money off the counterfeit seeds because the cost of production tends to be much lower than uh, cost of good seeds. So what are systemic solutions for doing so? And I think we saw that uh, there are sort of solutions that are used by pharmaceutical companies like uh, end use authentication that could be applied to seed industry, but then only in the cases where there's no bulk breaking in the system because you need to have some level of package integrity that runs through the supply chain for you to be able to apply those solutions. Uh, there's also a question on quality assurance and how that works in this space, because even if you were to set up an end-use authentication and assuming that you're able to manage the package integrity by pick, playing around with packet sizes, uh, you still have this problem where how do you make sure that the people who are producing the seed, even if they're certified buyers, actually do that? And then becomes the role of how do you run quality assurance in these systems? And we're currently uh, working at the Gates Foundation, helping them think through uh, first fixing the underlying what we call as pipes uh, for you to be able to do the counterfeiting solutions, which is actually running quality assurance effectively in seed supply chains. And we think that's going to help you drive greater benefits and you can add technology solutions on top of it. A lot of companies are interested in addressing this too. Large companies, especially in, sec in commodities like maize, are already doing massive education programs with farmers. There's a lot of litigation that goes in. In parallel, they have people who go to markets and look at it. So I feel like overall, um, once the market develops, uh, for instance, I mean, one has to wonder as to why is there no counterfeiting in developed markets? Uh, because it's just a greater incentive for people. There's a lot of money to be lost for big private companies, and then there are greater investments in addressing counterfeiting that are going to happen. So it's a part of evolution, part of fundamental infrastructure issues, and part of technology could actually answer that problem. 
on the NGO question. Uh, I mean, the role of the NGO sector, well, NGOs, is a, that's a real broad brush stroke. I mean, certainly NGOs as research institutes will continue to play an important role, uh, especially with the crops that have uh, you know, less commercial potential. Uh, in terms of, I mean, we rely on NGOs for a lot of seed distribution in a lot of uh, countries. I don't see that role going away anytime soon. Uh, you know, over time, seed companies, as they get more and more to the last mile, will eventually take up some of that role. Uh, but uh, at least for the the near and medium term, the NGOs continue to play key roles in the seed sector. All right. Well, I, I don't like to keep anyone past our official end time of 11. Um, so let's give one more round of applause to our presenters.